I, th I think that um, human competitions are, a, are a, a, a great tool. I can forge for two hours, but getting a pen in your hand and writing for two and a half hours is is a task. For me, a big thing is flagging up, change of posture, change of shoeing behaviour, and change of structure to the anatomy. We trim all the time, so I change of structure at the heels. I think some of those other signs that you might see on hind feet, particularly, would be toe dragging, um, because that indicates a, lock of, a loss of flexion through the limb. I've got different dressage clients that I shoe their horses with different sections. Welcome to the Lockdown Farriers podcast, the educational farrier podcast where we discuss the skills, knowledge and behaviour for the modern professional farrier. On a surface, it's exaggerated a lot more. They drop more through their medial aspect of the foot as it then drops down into the surface. With a concave shoe, you're actually biting into the surface more. So that was a 24, 48 hour temporary fixing, providing you follow the instructions. I would approach each horse like I was doing an exam. Episode 21. So this is kind of, if you like, part two of the dip tips. Um, <clears throat> obviously, last episode, we spoke to Simon Moore about diploma tips for the practical exam, for the diploma of the uh, Worship Company of Farrier's exam. Obviously, these were the dip tips which were published by the British Farriers and Blacksmiths Association recently. In this part two, we're turning our attention to the theory aspect, and that's the written and the oral exam. I've been honoured to be um, joined by Dr. Simon Curtis, FWCF, who until recently was one of the most senior examiners in the country. He's recently retired, although he still has a lot to do with the um, examination committee and the Worshipful Company, of which he'll explain more about in a bit. Listen all the way to the end of this one, because as most of you are aware, um, Simon has been doing a number of online webinars of late, which have been quite successful, um, and have had a lot of people attend. Um, and if you listen to the to the end of this, he is offering a discount code for the next webinar. Um, not going to give that away now. I'll let Simon do that later. Obviously, although these uh, diploma tips are primarily based at the diploma exam, there's a lot of take-home messages for those wanting to sit the associate of the Worshipful Company of Farrier's exam or any exam. Simon comes up with some really, really good, strong points and tips. And again, when you've had 30 years of experience of examining, you're going to see a lot of common mistakes. Take it away, Simon. <laughs> Okay. So thanks for joining us, Simon. Um, so just obviously anyone around the world listening to this knows about your Farrery history, but could you just talk a little bit about your experiences as an examiner, i.e. when you started examining, how you got into examining, and just how long you've been examining for? Okay, yes. Well, that's uh, a lot of experiences and a lot of time. Um, I passed my... Uh, fellowship around about 1989 and I was examining by uh, 1991 so uh, yes I've, I've just retired from the actual examining after 30 years of being an examiner um, I, uh, I I went through the same process as as everybody still does today in that I was invited by the, the then examination board and I was asked to do two probationary sessions. So along with the normal three examiners of two farriers and a vet, 
uh, there is quite often a probationary examiner, whether vet or farrier, trailing along, um, mainly listening and watching, but occasionally invited to uh, take part. <clears throat> and then you are, the examiners are doing two jobs. They're examining the candidates, but they're assessing your ability as well. And so it was recommended I became an examiner. And that's where I started. And um, I think my first exams were at Hereford. I've um, examined uh, in our three colleges that we have now, Hereford, Myers Co um, and Warwickshire College. And I've also been extraordinarily fortunate that I've examined in four countries, uh, four countries, four continents on earth. And I think I'm still the only Worshipful Company of Farrier examiner that's done that. So I've examined in the USA, South Africa, Australia, as well as Europe. Um, so it's been quite a ride for me. It's been a great experience. As I say, I stepped down only a couple of months ago, um, but I'm staying on the exam board and I now have the grand title of examiner emeritus, which basically means retired examiner. Uh, in Latin. Um, so I'm still very much involved in the exams and hoping to help develop them and still keep improving them in the next few years. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the one thing you must have seen over your time is how the exams, and including the higher exams, have developed. And funny enough, it was one of the things me and Simon Moore was talking about last night is the fact that and again, you get a lot of apprentices when we talk to them. Um, obviously, they come out of that, oh, yeah, but my ATF told me this is what happens on the exam. And you have to dispel those myths because, you know, some of these ATFs were basing it on the exam they sat 30, 20 years ago. And like I say, the change in my career being around the diploma and the higher exams, it has evolved quite a lot. And for... Uh, you know, a lot, most of the changes have been needed, you know, and because everything's changing, the world we're shooing has changed. So, yeah, it's, you must have seen a lot of changes in your time. I have seen a lot of changes, but the basic format of the exam is the same. But most of the changes have come about because there's obviously a responsibility in the UK where we are, um, if we pass a, a a candidate, then they get a license to shoe horses and we're regulated in the UK. So there's a legal requirement that we do a thorough job. Um, and also, if you think of the ramifications, if we unfairly failed somebody, we are depriving them of a living, or at least we are delaying their their opportunity to earn a good living. So that's, that's a, probably a big change. And we take that extremely seriously so whenever we're looked at either by the Farriers Registration Council or by government off call uh, we take their recommendations very seriously because we want to continue to be the examining body and we want to continue to do a professional job. Um, of course very recently uh, the associate exam the AWCF and the fellowship the FWCF have also been recognised by the UK's um, government authority on qualifications, which again is great news for farriers mm. because it means that their associate or their fellowship is recognised uh, as an equivalent of an academic qualification and therefore it has an equivalence worldwide, which it didn't before. So right. that's, but it means that we now have to keep this government body happy, not just on one exam, but on all three of our exams. And, <coughs> and, and we're up to that. Uh, and uh, it's a good discipline. It, 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 it um, keeps us on our toes and it means we continually review our exams. I mean, as you say, you've seen uh, things come in over the years. I think one of the things is the, um, the shoeing plan, for example, which... I think initially frightened probably both um, candidates and college tutors a bit. 
but um, as when it's properly used, it's actually an aid to the candidate. It's only mm. writing down what they say they're going to do, and then it's just checked afterwards that they've done what they said they're going to do. And and of course, there is also that always that proviso that, that is made quite clear to them that should they have taken the shoes off and found something else and want to change their shoeing plan, of course they can do that. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's worked really quite well. Um, I think the ex exhibition of shoes, of course, has come and gone and changed, and uh, we've mainly changed through outside influences. Um, we always had the shoe board, and we used to use it mainly as a talking point in the oral exam. And then the council probably 10 or 15 years ago said, how can this be part of the exam and not get marks? Mm. So 20% of the practical marks are attributed to it. That's a big wedge of marks. You know, somebody who does a good shoe board really sets themselves up and somebody who should we say, and it's normally because they can't really be bothered to go to that effort. Um, loses marks that they won't get back. Um, so that, that sort of changed that dynamic of the marking of the exam. Because Ofqual has come along and said, you cannot have something in an exam that's been made outside of the exam. So I think in two years' time, that will change again. But, but I, that's the nature of the beast that we're dealing with, as I say, that um, what was a great idea 15 years ago suddenly... Mm. Well, I think, I think we're... With the um, new trailblazer <laughs> apprentice standard and the endpoint yeah. assessment, because you know it's, 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 it's called an endpoint assessment now, and obviously yeah. there's different elements of that, and there's been a few changes which you know uh, are still in the sort of mixing pot, I suppose, uh, coming to light, like the trimming um, yeah. assessment and stuff like that. Which you know, some some argue each way, but you know, I think it's a step in the right direction long term. Um, and again, but for the B students, their shoe boards will be assessed in block seven yeah. as part of the gateway to be able to go forward to sit in the yeah. diploma. So again, they get they get a few months less time in the four years to make the shoes, but it's still plenty enough time. It's interesting you said about the off qual thing, because if you hadn't mentioned it, I was about to mention that. So just to confirm though, for those listening who don't know, those now with the associate is now a level five and the exactly. fellowship's a level six. So level six is equivalent of what is, I mean, there's a number of level sixes, but one of them is, which I think fits well, is a vocational degree. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have the level of um, a, uh, a full degree, but it has the level of a vocational degree. And I, I think a lot of farriers would be quite, proud of that and, mm. and that, so they should be it's finally getting some recognition of the effort that farriers put in you know in, in it kind of, well it kind of makes it a transferable skill then on paper absolutely if, if, if a farrier suddenly decides they want to do a master's or, or something they can now go to university and in just instead of just saying i'm a farrier with this uh diploma or associate or fellowship which none of you have heard of mm. um can i now do a master's or even a doctorate now they can go and say look this is i've got a level five or a level six and therefore they would be given um credit for prior learning um mm. by a university uh, and that would help uh, to reinforce to a university that they are the sort of person who could go further academically so that's that's really good news. Um, I want to just come back to the trimming because, as you say, there, there, there's some, and I'm glad you said you were for it, but as you said, there's some for it, some against it. For 20 years, I've tried to convince people that the main skill of a farrier is trimming a foot. Mm. And, okay, uh, probably two-thirds of horses are shod in this country. But that still leaves a huge whack of horses that are unshod and are trimmed and let's face it no horse was ever born in shoes so they all spend a period of their life without shoes and yet it wasn't recognized in our diploma mm. um so i i sort of failed 
to get my way for 20 years to get it introduced. And there was resistance from all sorts of quarters. And I'd have to say, we all sometimes complain about government interference and what have you, but it was uh, the new uh, trailblazer apprenticeship that said we needed to do this. And I mm. thought, thank goodness. And as you know, it will be introduced in about two years time. I'm not, not sure the exact timing. <coughs> it's, around um, about two, it's around about two years. Because... And, uh, you know, it, 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 farriers will be examined on their ability to trim a horse that is not going to have a shoe on. And I know that there are farriers that trim horses beautifully that don't have shoes on, but there are other farriers, and I've seen it all my life, that trim a foot as if it's going to have a shoe on and then just put the foot down. Mm. And that's not trimming an unshod foot. So I hope those that don't know catch up if they have apprentices so that their apprentices are well prepared. But obviously, I think there will be a period of um, ensuring that certainly the colleges and hopefully the ATFs know what the standards are. Mm. Um, yeah. Those standards have been written. I'm not sure if they've been disseminated. Yeah, they, they have now. They're all up on the Worshipful Company of Farriers webpage. You know, so, yeah, but it's, it's, it, to be honest, it was something which was starting to worry me because it – they have only just come out, so at least we can yeah. now. I mean, yeah, we know how to teach them how to trim a horse for unshod, but if you teach them to pass an exam, you kind of really want the examination criteria to base your syllabus off. So, but that's all been done now. That's all good. Um, what was I going to say? Um, just a quick point before we move on with these actual uh, theory diploma tips. Yeah. Um, I just got to congratulate you. Oh, because you, well, it's it's nothing massive, but I've just realised that you are the third Simon in a row that I've had as a guest on the podcast. You know, well, that, that maybe you need congratulating on getting a hat trick. Well, right, exactly. You know, it's um, it's, you know, Simon's not the most common name in the world, but I, I seem to have bagged three in a row, so that's <laughs> that's quite good. Um, obviously, leaving the best to last, obviously, of course. So flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> so anyway, um, obviously. The whole ethos or the whole sort of premise of this podcast is like the practical one with the National Association of Farriers and Blacksmiths recently um, posting the diploma tips on the build up to the um, exam. So it's obviously the exams are only a couple of weeks away now, um, but obviously just a audio put them tips into audio form for people listening and also just discuss um, some of the topics because these are all posters like bite-sized photo statements, um, which some of them just needed a bit more explanation and also why, why it helps because a lot of people won't kind of invest in a tip sometimes if they don't understand how it's going to help them. So that's the whole idea. So obviously the first tip we've got, um, just wait for my computer to move. There we go. Can you see that, Simon? Well, and to answer all questions with structure, not only will this help you, but it'll make marking easier for the examiner, which hopefully will lead to better marks. Yes, that's very true. And um, uh, yes, it's structure that gets you through everything. So when you read a question, um, you know, you, although some a lot of the questions do say they 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 show how marks are distributed, so that's telling you sometimes that it's a two-part question or a three-part question. It's really important that you answer the two parts. Um, everything is done now to try and help candidates uh, have a clear picture of what the question is. Nobody's trying to trick them. We want to find out what they know. But you have to help yourself as a candidate by reading it slowly and saying, oh, yes, this is a question of two parts. Um, draw the flexor tendons of the leg. Part two, what uh, injuries uh, can occur in the flexor tendons of the leg? So you've got to do two parts of that. So read them um, and then answer in the same structure as they're asked. 
so often you're asked a question and you need to say what the structure is, where it is, and then what it does. So where it is uh, and what it does. And, and, and then that helps you with, with lots of questions, sort of ask that. And, and if you give those parts, then the examiner can see that you've studied and you understand the answers to the questions. So structure is really important. Yeah, I think, I think there's a few more on structure as well. Um, just out of interest, obviously from an examiner's perspective, I mean, the examiners normally roll into town the night before the, or the afternoon before the exams and they all sit down together and they mark the exam papers. Um, mm. How does that process kind of work? Because obviously there's more than one examiner. We've got the senior examiner, the yeah. fairy examiner, and the veteran examiner. Can you just talk a little bit on how that process works? I can. Okay. So, yes, we have had the questions about a week before. So we look through them. Uh, then we come and gather together. And obviously I write notes. And we always start with a discussion before we start marking papers. So we say, you know, were they easily understood? Was there any questions there that we think are harder than others? Um, and so we have a general talk about it, even to the point of view of, you know, do you think this one was as clear as it should be? And we actually write a review paper as well as feedback on the questions because the examiners do not set the questions. We have a question setter and a moderating panel and they do it um, separate from us. So then we usually get out the first three uh, question or answer sets, I should say, and all three of us mark all three of those papers. And then we call out the marks. So the examiners are under pressure as well to see if they mark similarly. Mm. Obviously, they're not going to be exactly the same. Otherwise, we would only need one examiner. But if there's clearly a big difference in, in opinion, then we discuss why we're viewing it differently. So after those first three papers, we that, that gives you a bit of a marker or a, a datum line, which you set yourself. And then we basically mark all the papers and none of us knows how the others have marked them until we call them in to the registrar and they go straight in the computer. And again, and I, I can't tell you the exact percentage difference, but something like five or six percent difference between one marker and another. And that's probably half a grade. So probably, you know, if I give somebody a B, it's OK if somebody gives them a C plus. But it doesn't show up on the computer. If I give somebody a B and another examiner gives them a C, uh, there's an alarm comes up and it's like uh, you're a bit too far apart. Why is that? Mm -hmm. And it is sometimes as simple as, um, you know, one examiner misses something or one examiner clearly has a dislike of a part of a, an answer. And um, so it's then moderated. And of course, it's usually moderated by the chairman of that board, the more senior Farrier examiner. And, and we reach an agreement. Um, so, so that's really how it's done, because it's all computerized now on the tablets. The tablet actually tells us if, if we're too far apart. Yeah, if we're if if we're uh, not exactly the same, but we're within a close margin, then it doesn't say a thing, and it just averages the marks out. Yeah, and that's that pretty much works exactly the same on the on the practical exam as well. Does, yeah. um, and and do do the examiners have a obviously the people who set the questions? Do they also set a, a marking guide answer? Yes. Yeah, they do. They, they, it's not so much a model paper. We don't get a model paper written. Uh, we do get a marking guide, uh, and it sort of goes along the lines almost of uh, what, uh, what they should say in their answer. And then, uh, usually it's put in italics, what uh, an outstanding candidate would know, so that mm. we get a bit of a take on that. And even occasionally the, the marking guide would, would say, uh, you know, you cannot pass somebody if they don't know this. That's quite rare to say that. Mm. Um, but you imagine, you know, I gave the example of the flex attendance, somebody that didn't know that there was, you know, four tendons below the carpus and the hock and two flexors and two 
stances, you'd start to say, well, is that diploma level? Mm. And clearly it's not. So, um, I, you know, I think the other thing people probably don't realise in the candidates is uh, the examiners are fallible as well and they don't have a monopoly of knowledge. I mean, one of the things that's kept me up to date is examining. But I have occasionally had candidates that have written things and I've thought, I'm neither sure whether that's right or wrong. And I usually take some textbooks and I look it up and I think, my goodness, this chap or chapette knows a lot. And of course, they get highly marked because they've written well above and beyond what I know. And that's always a nice feeling, uh, you know, to get that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, moving on to the next slide now. So the next theory tip, answer anatomy questions in this format. Location, obviously where it's found and where does it go? Form, what it's made of, and function, what does it do? Um, obviously, I know... I that's almost what I just said, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that is. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, there's, there's different... With all these different um, uh, subheadings... Um, and, and different formats you know there's many different formats but they're all you know they they all fit different types of questions don't they well well they do but ones like that fit an awful lot of questions and it's just a good and you soon know if it doesn't fit and you think well yeah that doesn't apply to this one but in revision candidates should get in the habit of doing that and mm. they will find it works for most of them yeah, I mean, the thing is, I mean, from my side of the coin, the educating side, when we teach them subjects, it's how we teach them because it's logical. And if then they process it in that manner and compartmentalise it in their brains and file it away in that manner, and then it comes out in that manner. Yeah. So it's this format. I mean, there's nothing worse when you see you you give uh, sort of pre-diploma students say, a 20-mark question and it just comes in as two sheets of solid writing with no subheadings yeah. very difficult um next tip again same formats again but answer practical questions in this format so what well, it says practical questions but probably more to do with um pathologies and common ailments definition yeah. signs causes treatment and prognosis again that can be broken down further normally certainly how we teach is we normally put anatomy after the definition because obviously we're talking about a certain part of the horse with a condition we've got to talk about that anatomy part haven't we simon yes sorry i was waving to my wife going i thought he was waving at me i thought he was telling me to shut up sorry <laughs> <laughs> no that's all right um yes uh, you know and you have to you have to vary it but yes definition uh one one trick i'd have to say for definition because i had it with an apprentice today is that you cannot use the same word in the definition as what you're defining. In other words, somebody asks you to define what a football is, you can't say it's a ball-shaped thing. Hmm. And uh, you would be surprised how many people just repeat what they've been asked as if that's the answer. Hmm. Um, I was going to say, however, one trick for answering questions, I know it's not on this slide, is that if you to make you answer the question properly uh, and and uh, should we say in a logical manner if you put the question in your first sentence of your answer it will make you answer it so here's an example the question says why do horses stumble you answer horses stumble because that makes you and then you do a list don't you of, of what mm -hmm. makes them stumble and then you get into it so it's a real trick you can ask any question that's asked you can usually put in the first sentence and that will make you answer it. It's yeah. just a trigger to yourself. Because Absolutely. Also, if you look at this question, you think, oh, how am I going to answer this? Or where do I start? You start mm. by putting the question in the answer. Yeah. And, and I, everything flows from that. I mean, I, I always say to students as well, like, you know, that definition or even a, 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 an introduction to an answer is very important because that's your kind of opening gambit. It's a short, sharp statement of intent of where you're going and it switches your mind onto that part of, in your brain where that information yeah, stored. So, um, it also switches the examiner on as well. Yeah. The, the examiners straight away. Yes. This is, this person's going to answer this. 
just just out of interest, I thought you might be able to clear this up because um, I've heard various variant sort of um, answers to this. So when the candidate writes his written paper, a lot of them do make short notes beforehand and plan their answer. If, for example, you know, for 20 mark questions with certain key points you're looking for, if they missed those off, but in their paper, their note work, they did. We don't mark their note work. You don't, you don't, you do no, that would be unfair. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't look through it as somebody that's answered a good question and then said, oh, look, they've made a mistake in their note work. Any, so you can't look. Through, we don't look at, we can see what's the note work. Yeah. And it's just put to the back of the pile. So, I, so we can't go, no, that's doing a almost detective work, isn't it? And that's not what marking a paper is yeah. about. Well, that, that, that's good to know because I was say I, I'd heard sort of various things, not from the actual fish, just sort of like the rumour mill you hear yeah. where people anecdotally talk about exams, but if you'd missed something off your paper, but you'd got it in your notes, then you would sort of like maybe sort of retrieve that well, point. obviously not have i never looked at the notes i've never been with other examiners that have i would occasionally say that obviously in the scramble to put stuff together uh they're sometimes mixed in with the papers you know in, in the candidates and we sort of say no these are notes mm. so they get put in the back you know but um but even then you're not you know, we're too busy and we've got too many papers to mark to go thinking, oh, I might have a little peek at what their notes were. I'm afraid mm. that's... Well, that's interesting. That's, that's, thanks for clearing that up. Um, next tip, which was on the website, as simple as this sounds, not that many cam candidates use this format, all questions can be answered like this. You do not have to use subheadings, but may be helpful to write these as bullet points before commencing writing your answer. Okay, you, you were asking me earlier about changes in, in the exam. Uh, when I started examining, all questions, should we say, were answered with essay-style answers. And bullet points were a bit frowned upon. And I, I was one of those that would have been against them. And now I can see that actually we don't live in a particularly literate world. And they make it easier for the examiner if they write. So don't be frightened to use bullet points, but bullet points are just that. They don't give the depth. So as I, you know, I, I gave that example of why do horses stumble and you think, yes, because they need shoeing, because the toes are long, uh, maybe because they've got a neurological disease. So you write all these down. Then you write in a bit of detail. And then, of course, the thing to always remind yourself that this is a farrier exam you might be surprised the number of candidates that manage to write answers that avoid all mentions mention of trimming and shoeing and you know you think well maybe because they think they'll be caught out it's a farrier exam clearly there are farrier answers to some of these things and so yeah i would say use bullet points but don't think that five questions answered with only bullet points is going to get you a diploma. It won't. No, no, exactly. Um, in fact, well, before we go on to the oral exam examination, yeah, um, oh, I've just gone the wrong way. Hang on, bear with me. But yeah, before we go on about the oral examination, uh, can we just touch on diagrams? How important are diagrams to answering the questions? Okay. The first thing is, again, about reading your question clearly. If it says illustrate your answer, illustrate does mean a diagram. Now, technically, if it just says describe the tendons, describe means right. But we are all aware that, uh, you know, a picture paints a thousand words and a good diagram really shows that you know your stuff and your anatomy. So even when diagrams aren't asked for, I would use them as long as you've answered the question as well. My biggest tip for diagrams is draw big. Mm. And if you're an apprentice now studying for your diploma, if you don't draw big, if you do this little diagram in the corner, then teach yourself to draw big. You will not be charged for the paper at the end of the exam. Uh, nobody can draw something very well, you know, small. 
No. Most farriers can draw quite well. We use our hands and our eyes all, all day long. Nobody's looking for a work of art, but just clearly outlined drawings uh, of a good size will get you marks. Um, the other thing to do is only colour if you have to, to make something clear. Colouring takes time. Mm. Don't waste your time colouring unless, you know, you've got a diagram with, arteries, veins, and nerves, and you need to separate them or, or something of that nature. Otherwise, black and white, nice and big, nice and clear. And if you reckon you can't do it now, anybody listen to this, then practice. There's yeah. probably only 40 or 50 diagrams that you could ever be asked for. Yeah. You, you should practice them all. Learn them off by heart. Why not? I, felt, I, I think from marking students' work, one of my biggest pet peeves with um diagrams though is incorrect labeling well that of course proves you don't know the answer and you do lose <laughs> marks so yes if you're going to do it um you know but it's it, the other thing is it's a great revision tool isn't it yeah but to to draw the bones label them the main parts start putting the ligaments on label them and while you're revising you can check and then, then put the tendons on. And then, you know, if, if you do that, drawing and labelling is probably the best revision that you can do. And it really uh, lodges it in your brain. Mm. I know we had some uh, transferee students here once. And again, what you said about with the diagrams going big, I, I've always told, I was always taught and I've always taught them that, you know, do, your di do the diagram on a separate page, use a whole page. And um, I remember one, one of the transferees once said about the, co the college he came from had told him or the lecturer they'd had there had told him uh, draw as many diagrams on the page as you can in between the writing because the examiners don't like too many bits of paper, which I thought would make you chuckle. Well, it does <laughs> make me chuckle. And as a, a college tutor yourself, so I will tell you what I tell students. Your tutors will not be examining you. No, exactly. You know, I mean, I've never heard any examiner say that. No examiner worries about lots of bits of paper. We do worry where sometimes people don't put what question it's, it's down to. And if you have two similar questions, it, it, we, we're trying to be fair. And therefore, we're saying, oh, yeah, this diagram goes with, you know, question two. But it doesn't take anything to write question two in the top corner. So, so no, you don't need to cram diagrams in, put them on the same page as the writing at all. Um, uh, it, it's nice if you put them in the correct order and they have um, what question you're referring to on them. But otherwise, no. The, the, uh, diagrams, illustrations get you marks more than anything. I yeah. They get you marks. Yeah. I mean, this is the good thing about um sort of conversations like this and the one i did last night and the diploma tips in the um, forge magazine and stuff like that is because there's a lot of sort of like there's a lot of per uh, perceived secrecy about the exams and that's because unless you're doing the exam or facilitating or examining you never get to come in and watch but you know i've had to battle against so much and it total untruth about what you can and can't do and i've heard some absolute crazy stuff over the years um and it's just quite nice to put all that kind of thing to bed really with a conversation like this right so moving away from the uh, written obviously the other part of the theory exam is the dreaded oral or some people prefer the oral part i personally always prefer oral um because you know, you having a conversation, which is what we do, you know. So uh, first tip on the BFBA uh, Facebook was if you think you've answered the question incorrectly or insufficiently on your written paper, then the oral examination will be your chance to enhance your mark. Just make sure you've revised any weaker areas. This will give you time to retrieve any marks you may have lost. That's often true. I mean, it does require the examiner to ask you. But, I mean, I was actually giving um, a little bit of coaching to two future candidates this afternoon. And my advice to them was, 
when you've finished your written paper and it's usually these days on a friday isn't it yeah and you, and you know that's a stressful two and a half hours and you want to go down the pub and have a drink or something if you're staying there or just get home nobody who takes a diploma seriously can forget those questions i still remember mine from 1983 because they were important to me i i remember but, the one i got wrong <laughs> well that's a day those ones always sit even more in our memory but so the trick is to write them down yeah and then when you get home you've got at least two days until you're oral and you might have up to a week you check your own answers get your textbooks out and check your own answers you will remember everything you've said and when you think oh heck i got that wrong or oh heck i should have said this I'm sure heck is probably not the word you'll use, but anyway, <laughs> when you realize that you've not um, answered it, then then you will now remember the answer. Now, you might get the chance, and if you get the chance to say, then of course, spit it straight out. Say, look, I can't believe I forgot to write this. Mm. And, and examiners accept that, and your mark goes up. But I was also saying in this coaching period I had this afternoon, that um, I, the examiners, obviously three of them, we, we don't want any confusion and we don't want to duplicate questions. So after the written exam, <clears throat> we uh, divide up the work. So there's a division of labor. And it, there's usually some obvious veterinary questions, which the vet says, well, I'll, I'll ask them any of these that I want clarified. And shoeing theory questions and... When I was the senior examiner, I used to give that to the other fair examiner because I actually, I never used to ask a question that was in the written exam. I used to say, I've got too many questions to worry about what's in the past, but it was divided up. So uh, it's up to a candidate, you know, it's not so structured. I mean, a candidate could say to an examiner, I would like to say about something I didn't write in my exam. And they're not going to be rebuffed for that. So, in fact, I think they'll be looked on quite highly. As I say, you, you're, you know, for, for realising you've missed something and putting it right. So that's the first thing. Check your questions. Mm. Um, I, I would say I, I've got a feeling I would need to check on it, but I've got a feeling with, with the new system that we've been told you can't ask questions twice. In other words, again, government body felt that if you've answered a question in the written rightly or wrongly it is unfair then to raise it in in the oral part of the examination mm. so uh, we will possibly be under those rules later on and therefore it will be more difficult for somebody to put it right but um i i sort of understand both sides of that yeah. um, and as i say there's enough questions to ask i mean without going all I mean, I mean, from a positive perspective, that tip's also got a good positive connotation as well, because what happens to most students is they sit that exam on the Friday morning and then they've got the Friday afternoon, the weekend and the rest of the week leading up to the diploma exams to worry about it. Yeah. If you go back to your room or whatever over the weekend and you go through the paper and you go through your books if you're, you know, if you've got most of the stuff, then you can kind of forget about your written from that point and worry about the practical, which is going to hit you in a couple of days' time. Yeah. You know, the amount of people who turn up on exam day and they all, they're still flustered about the written paper and actually they need to be switched on to the practical. Well, you, you can learn from great sportsmen. Great sportsmen, whatever has happened two minutes ago, they put behind them. It's yeah. irrelevant. The last golf shot is irrelevant to them. Yeah. The last cricket shot, the last missile hit on goal is irrelevant. And you should, they, you know, I know it's your job to get it across that across them, Danny. Yeah. I mean, as I say, I even today I was doing a bit of coaching, but, but that's the way I view it. You can't change the past. Certainly don't allow it to screw up the future. You know, you just get on and, um, and, and, and that's what you've got to do. I know it's not easy, but, Every candidate needs to understand that, that, uh, you know, to focus, you put behind you what's gone, gone on before. It, it's irrelevant.
Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, I we we at Hereford for many years now is as soon as as soon as they come out of that that exam, the written exam, they all march off into Dean Bland's office. And all Dean will ask him what were the questions, what were the marks, and then he will type up because he's very good at typing. He will type up because obviously you can't leave the exam with the exam paper. No. Um, so obviously, when you've got ten students and you ask them what were the questions, and they all repeat the questions chapter and verse, like you say, no one ever forgets it. Um, yeah, and so he will type them out a copy. Like, Sort of, sort of a long-winded photocopy of the um, paper, and then they can take that home and digest that over the next coming week. And obviously, we've got revision papers for the next guys coming in as well. So, you know, it's something we've always done, and I do think it's from a positive point of view. You know, if you go back and look in your books and you're happy that you scored all the points needed or answered the question correctly, that's a positive in itself. Or if there has been a few weaknesses in that question, um, you can revise up on it in case you get asked in your oral. So, right. And next one then, uh, tip two for the oral. If you can't think of an answer to a question in the oral, ask the examination, examiner if he could possibly come back to that question a little later. This will avoid any awkward silences and you thinking that it's all gone wrong. Examiners are sensible, human, apparently, and understand that we have temporary memory loss. When it does come back to you, just let the examiner know. I think that's a great tip. Mm. And I, I certainly don't want the awkward silences. And the awkward silences means I am not getting information from a candidate and it makes it harder for me to assess them. So, yes. And if they suggest that all the better, because... It's sometimes quite difficult for a, an examiner to say, OK, we'll leave that. Um, let me ask you this thing, because immediately the candidate is thinking, oh, shit. So if they take control by saying that, I'd, I'd be all for that. And I think it's a very sensible tip for mm. them. Well, I think the thing is, I don't know if they all realise this, but when they do their oral, they've only got 10 minutes with each of the examiners someone rings a bell and you move on. And if you don't say anything, then you're not going to get any points. No, we, we can't mark people who don't answer questions, I'm afraid. We can't assume that they were keeping it all secret, that they know it. So, yes, it, I mean, you need to engage. And actually, the other thing which I think took a long time for candidates and the colleges to come to terms with is that you get an equal weighting of marks for the written paper and for the oral. And as mm. you said, three... Three 10 minute sessions with the examiners gets you as many marks as two and a half hours sat writing. Yeah. But as you know, you, it's quite extraordinary how much extra information you can get orally from somebody because you can, uh, you know, I, I think often in that 10, 10 minutes, you're getting 25 or 30 questions, or, you know, you're getting subdivisions of questions and you're going down the line. Um, uh, that, that your answers are taking the, the examiner down that line for them. So so you just have to remember that the oral is worth as much. It's worth half of your, um, of your knowledge mark, so it's worth a quarter of your diploma. And uh, it, it's really, really important. And it will... I mean, most, most candidates, our experience is, as examiners, is that <clears throat> barrier candidates outperform... Uh, the the written work by usually about five percent. Mm. So somebody who gets sixty percent in the written will usually get sixty five. Obviously, there's variations on that, and I can remember somebody on fifty nine percent and sixty, as you know, is the pass mark. And we thought, well, they'll drag themselves above that. No, they actually did worse in the in the mm. uh, in the oral. But that that is quite a rarity. So. Again, for those potential candidates listening, they shouldn't be frightened by the oral because they usually perform better. You know, if they're not particularly literate, they find it hard sometimes to get their ideas on on paper because they don't write much, but they do do a lot of talking. And, um, and so they, they get the answers over uh, far better in the oral. So don't yeah. be frightened of it. Yeah, and and I think the fear is a big thing. I mean, I mean, and credit to Dean Bland. Um, when Dean first started, 
when he first came and taught at Hereford, um, we had a diploma exam and obviously he'd done a load of pre-diploma teaching with him. And he was absolutely horrified when we got to the or after the practical, we got to the orals. He was horrified just how nervous the students were. And obviously he was doing his teaching degree at the time. And one of the, um, I think it was an action research project he did was um what he brought in with us, bear in mind this was in the old MVQ system, was at the end of each block, the students all got a practical and a uh, written assessment and a block test. And he just simply put an oral exam in there. And we run it pretty much how you guys do, where Dean will be doing live horse like the vet does. Alan will be doing, you know, he'll be sat there asking general Fowry questions and have a bit of, you know, uh, a sagittal section and things like that. And then they'll come in with me with the shoe shoes they've made that block and we'll ask them about the shoes. So, you know, they've had um, at least seven or eight assessments like it before they hit the um, diploma, which, and it's, I, I've seen a massive change in these guys sat in my office before they go and do the oral exam. Now, you know, they're a lot more chilled out about it, which is good. So well, I, I, there, there has been an improvement. There are still some that, you know, shake and sweat unbelievably. But, but I'm actually, I'm sure you've seen it. Occasionally you get students who get wound up when it's a mock exam. Yeah. And, and I've done mock exams for apprentices. And I say to them, you know, this mock doesn't matter. There is no point being nervous. So sometimes people just naturally, the, you know, adren adrenaline flow is overwhelming and they shake and they lose it a bit. And I, I, I'm not sure how you overcome it apart from those candidates that you know actually have the knowledge. You just say to them, look, you do know this and you are going to pass. So, so just go in there and show them what you know. And, um, and, and that's all I've ever been able to do with some really nervous candidates. But, mm. you know, that's, um, I'm afraid that's human nature. It's not just to do with farriery. Exams occasion, occasionally do funny things to people. I mean, there's very few people who outperform in their exams. Um, I am one of those peculiarities, actually. And, and bizarrely, I barely think I should admit this, I actually always enjoyed exams. So, um, yeah, that's a bit bizarre, I know. Maybe I'm a sadomasochist or something like that. I don't know. Just well, me. I mean, yeah, but I mean, I think that is a thing. And some people generally, I mean, you know, you look at all these ad adrenaline junkies who do sort of adrenaline in sports. Well, going into an exam, you know, there is a certain fix you get. Um, you know, again, it's just like going to a shoeing competition. You yeah. know, you're putting yourself... Um, it's, yes, it's about the competition, but you are also putting your work under someone else's watchful eye, mm. you know. Um, so uh, tip number three, as far as you're all, I think this is the last actual tip we've got. As you can see, I think last night with the practical, there was like 20 odd tips. But it, again, when it comes to the oral, it was always a lot less. Um, people, you know, Farrah's do like talking about. Well, I've got a list here. Oh, well, there you go. We'll just do this one first then. So yeah. you shouldn't be asked anything in the oral examination, but you don't know. If, however, you don't know something, then politely point out to the examiner and he or she will either prompt you to move on. You won't necessarily fail the examination and it's not the end of the world. It could just uh, slightly affect your marks. Nobody ever failed an exam on a single question. I know a lot of people focus on that. And if they fail, they remember that one where they gave a silly answer. But uh, you've got to remember that in the oral, as I say, you get asked lots of questions and you've got um, two other examiners. And um, so it's all diluted down. So, so people don't fail over one. It, it's just the same in the practical, you know, they don't fail on one mistake unless, you know, they've stuck their nail straight through the middle of the sole. Um, it, you know, usually it's an accumulation of, of smaller mistakes. And that's the same in the oral. When you continue to get things wrong, uh, that's when examiners come to the conclusion that, that um, you don't know enough to pass the, the, the exam. But 
it it's not one thing that that isn't what fails you mm. you know exactly um so like you've just alluded to simon you've got a, a list well <laughs> we have done some of that list let me turn this light round which may well take the light off me a bit so I can see this and put my glasses on. All right, I'll go through my list, written, diagram size, we've done that, and colour and label clearly. Okay, when you do your written exam, you've got two and a half hours. Do not go over 25 minutes for each question. That will give you 25 minutes at the end, and that gives you time to read through and probably another 10 minutes of writing because the brain works in a funny thing, in, in a funny way, I should say. While you're answering one question, it is actually working out the answer to another. And that's why you do this thing. You know, you said about delaying a question in the oral, why it comes back to you. Because your brain isn't just working on its conscious level. So uh, re make sure you have time to read it through. If, if you have a question that you really like the answer as soon as you read through the questions, you don't have to answer in order. So answer that one first. It will really get you going, but still don't go over 25 minutes because then you're left with a question that you struggle with a bit and you haven't got any, enough time. So be disciplined. And um, between now and when you take your exam, when you do a mock, stick to that. 25 minutes of question, that leaves you 25 minutes to go over. Go over them. Um, all right, I've said check your answers after the exam, and we went through format your answers. Um, and I also said the thing that aren't, most answers can be uh, at least started in the first sentence. And that's the impact sentence. It immediately tells your examiner uh, you know your stuff. Um, oh, yes, here's a new one. Don't call your examiners by anything other than their surnames. We we did we talked that, about that last that, night. Right. No, we talked about that last night, and actually, you were the example uh, from that uh, diploma sitting which you and Simon did down at Hereford. Where, yes, he, he was someone who knows you, um, but yeah, he came up and said, uh, "Can you have a look at his shoe, Simon?" <laughs> In the middle of it, yeah. yeah. And um, so it's not, you know, we don't need people being obsequious and yes, sir, no, sir. Although I have to tell you a quick story. I went down, because I always try and go to the diplomas that I've been examiner for. If no other reason that all the people down there getting their diploma, you have passed, so you're very mm. popular. Yeah. Free and, drinks, uh, innit? And I, well, I, I remember all these candidates who were yes, sir, no, sir, to me. And then it's, you having a pint, Simon? <laughs> and I thought, well, there's nothing I can do about this. So, but in the exam, come on maintain a bit of formality it's a formal situation uh and especially if you embarrass your examiners you don't put them in a good mind for you uh if you do not understand the question then say so we've sort of covered that but yeah. just say that ask them to repeat it and if you don't know the answer if you then 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 just say i really don't know the answer to that i think it would be a brain freeze because as has been said, you know, you've had a four year apprenticeship, you've had a good training, lots of chance to learn this knowledge. You should know it and, and you probably do know it. Uh, do not bullshit. I can't put it any better way than that. No. And see through it straight away, you know, save that for the pony club girls, if you will, but do not use it on your examiners. It really annoys them. Mm. Um, I've got here be on time because uh, we have actually had a candidate that didn't turn up on time or turned up 15 minutes late, and that made them six months late in their apprenticeship because mm. they weren't allowed to start. So they got put back six months. And for all the rowing and the pleading and the threatening, they came back in six months' time. Mm. So be on time. Yeah. Why anybody would want to be late for their exam, I don't know. You might not want to be there, but if anything, get yourself in even earlier gives you a chance to settle your nerves a bit. Yeah. Well, funny enough, I've got a student who's um, obviously uh, around pre-diploma um, clinics. Sort of, and I've, he he's probably lives closer to the college than any other student, yet he's late every day. Um, so Declan Flynn, if you're listening, get an alarm clock. <laughs> you know, well, I, well, I don't mean to globally name and shame him, but he needs to, he needs to get an alarm clock. <laughs> There we are. 
So it's a good life skill as well. Well, Get exactly. In the morning and arriving on time as mm. a farrier. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you got any more, Simon? No, I uh, went. To, as I say, at least half of them we'd gone through, so that so, was good. So just then, just sort of like to finish off because obviously it's dinner time. Um, have you? Is there any sort of common mistakes you see time and time again, sort of in the written or the oral part of the exam, and and silly common mistakes where people just get themselves in a bit of a pickle? Um, I'm not sure in the written. I mean, we've covered the common mistakes. I mean, common mistakes. Well, for a start, are not writing enough. I mean, that clearly shows you don't know enough because two and a half hours, I, I would say somebody that knows their stuff should be writing two pages for each question, should produce 10. And I know when I did mine, I produced about 20. Now, I know I, though I'm relatively illegible, I can write fast. So that gives you an idea. You know, people that write a third of a page for a, for a whole question that really tells you you haven't got enough knowledge. So, so it, again, in your, in your um, practicing, in your revision, you should be looking at how much you produce. And, uh, you know, that's how much those questions are expected to produce. And you asked me earlier about the guide to the examiners. We're always telling ourselves that we don't expect candidates to know or produce all that. Because sometimes for a question, we have four or five pages. Mm. Uh, of writing so there's usually a lot behind every single question um and and so you should be able to draw it out um i i think sometimes okay when there's an absolute direct question you've got to answer it absolutely directly but there's often additional information and as i say always tell yourself this is a farrier exam so therefore we shoe horses. That's what is often the answer to some of your questions is how you trim them and shoe them. The other trick, so here's a trick to remember. Whenever a question says, how would you shoe? You should first think, how would I trim? Mm. So you can't shoe a horse without trimming it. Well, you can, but you don't usually do a very good job. So when that question says, and you'll have at least one question, how would a farrier shoe a horse with blah de blah you think, yeah, how would I trim it first? And you would, tr and don't just put, I would balance it because then, the, you know, you've got to put how you would balance it. And if it's a certain condition, you know the foot shape and you know how you're likely, you need to trim it. So um, I think I've wandered off your original bit there, actually, Danny. Yeah, that's all right. Wander away. It's an age thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just a quick one as well i mean this is something i again an uh, anecdotal fact i i've heard time and time again come up and i don't know where it comes from but will you get extra marks in your written paper for quoting and referencing other authors well anything that makes you look erudite well read um makes you look like you have studied the work provided you get it right now i actually i told you i can remember my diploma from 1983 mm -hmm. there was a question on the navicular bone and i remember quoting that it was john hickman and uh, collis who had done the work on on navicular disease uh, now i was a bit lucky because um i knew both john hickman and Chris Collis because they worked in Newmarket well Hickman more in Cambridge so they were local but even I at that time as a young farrier I thought yeah this is going to hit them right between the eyes because mm -hmm. they're going to think wow where did that come from so yeah of course it makes you look and you are more studious um, but as I say as long as it's not um, bullshit um, <laughs> because they're probably going to check it up you know they sit around that examiner's table and say, hey, how about this candidate that, that quoted so-and-so writing this, you know, in, in, in 2007? Very easy now to check those things on your phone. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, you know, the more detail, the better. It's shown that you've studied. Um, why not? 
So yeah, you know, you're going to put um, that Hickman says or Collis says. Actually, I ought to cover that as well because occasionally there's conflicting um, uh, advice from authors, and you know, the examiners know that, and so again, any candidate that can say, "Well, there's two theories on this," or uh, there is conflicting advice on this. They're held in in higher esteem as a candidate because they've shown that they understand the subject to the depth. Well, they know there's there, there's a debate over it, and there's more than one idea. So, no, they don't they don't knock you down. They they put you up for giving those sort of answers. Right. Well, before you go, I've obviously had you here long enough, and I am aware that the pubs are now open. Um, um, <laughs> You've got some webinars coming up very shortly. I have, Danny. Yes, I have. And and here's an offer for you and your listeners. If um, wh what we'll do is uh, we'll give them a discount. Any of your listeners, yeah, they will have to apply to the webinar, and they will have to use the code Danny. All right, oh, that's an easy one to remember. It's Danny now, is it? What was it before? I can't remember. I, I, I thought it was lockdown, but... All right, lockdown. I know it's something to do with you. Right. <laughs> lockdown is the is the passcode. So you just go on there, and when you go through to buy your ticket, there you can see that there is a place where you can get a discount with a code. So, right. um, and if you do that, I don't know when this goes out, if it's still the early bird time, uh, then you get a double discount because you get a discount for being early and you get a discount from lockdown. So I'm going to send this through to my technician so that they're ready. I know this is not, this isn't live. So it gives us a couple of days to get ready. Yeah. The webinars um, are full of lots of information. I know the ones that we've done so far have been well received and I would hope they would help anybody studying for an exam um you know it's it's more information in a, in another uh, format uh, also you do get some written material so uh, thank you for reminding me of that danny and mm. uh, we're more than happy to offer your listeners that opportunity yeah i mean i mean, I, I obviously I, did, I i didn't attend the last one i believe I, I i had a tutorial myself with some students online i was doing so i missed the last one but funny enough listening to our other podcast friend brian mullins the other day he did um he did uh, name check your webinar all the way from canada so i believe he was at the last one i think he thoroughly enjoyed it and got a lot from it as well so yeah it's um th the one good thing which has come out of lockdown um is all this online uh cpd call it what you want which has been going on you know which you can't beat turn up in person having a few beers afterwards but you know learning's got a lot easier you know oh it's accelerated things they they think it's accelerated stuff like this by five years as i say mm. i uh you know like yourself been doing podcasts for a while pre pre um, the COVID um, epidemic, but webinars, certainly, I mean, I did some online meetings, just very few business ones, but I'd never attended a webinar and um, here I am doing them now and um, enjoying doing them. And as I say, fortunately, they seem to be getting well received um, and we're going to keep doing them as long as people want us to do them. Yeah, and, uh, I, the main I, purpose is you know, to, to, to expand this education base. So that's why I'm more than happy to offer this discount because we yeah. just, we want you there. Right? Well, the great thing is the global platform as well. I mean, the thing is, I mean, I, I suppose the, um, the, the, the trouble with you, Simon, and your, your podcast is the fact that you're, you're, you, I, you like to take not do nice on location, very summery, hot, warm weather climates. <laughs> I do. You know, and obviously lockdowns kind of ruined that. I mean, <coughs> yeah, so. yeah, it did. Fortunately, I had a few in the bag. Yes, I think, again, um, only on, um, I've only done them on five continents, I think. So, uh, yeah. and they're usually in the warm, and I do love those tropical ones where you can uh, hear the birds twittering in the background. Um, yeah. But 
Uh, yeah, I, I as, as you know, I actually like my podcast face to face. I like to look the person in the eyes and see if they're telling me the truth. So, <laughs> you know, this one with you, I've got my dark glasses on, so you can't see. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, A, for your um, your um, code, um, f- discount code, sorry. And thanks for taking so much time to um, try and put some of these apprentices or candidates' minds at rest. Thank you very much, Simon. My pleasure, Danny. Thank you. So a big thank you then to Dr. Simon Curtis for taking part and sharing his experience with us. And also, thank you for sharing that unique discount code for the next webinar. Remember, go onto his website. If you're getting there early and get an early bird ticket, you get a further discount. But type in the code LOCKDOWN to get your 25% discount off that. I hope you um, found this um, useful and See you next time.